All right, all right. So I'm Knox Coleman. I'm moderating the session uh, on gender inequity um, at the Water and Health Conference. And first up, we have Darcy Anderson uh, with the Water Institute at UNC. Hey, thanks, Knox. Let me just get my screen shared. Am I up and running? Yep, and so just if you have any questions, please post them in the Pathol chat. Um, remember, instead of the Zoom chat, and then um, I can relay those questions after the presentation. Great, thanks. So as I'm sure many of you in the audience are familiar, men and women have really different experiences when it comes to WASH. Women and girls often carry a disproportionate burden of WASH-related duties. They're often the ones that are responsible for tasks such as water fetching and management of child feces. Women and girls have additional concerns related to modesty, safety, and privacy during defecation and hygiene that are not shared by men. And they also face additional physical challenges for accessing adequate facilities that are equipped for menstrual hygiene management. And when we think about gender and WASH, we often think about it in terms of program beneficiaries, but there's less evidence about how gender roles actually impact WASH implementers themselves. And that's what I'm gonna focus on today. So for this study, we had three different objectives. We were looking to describe the differences between men and women implementers of rural WASH programs, specifically at the local level, differences in approaches to implementation, challenges and sources of support for implementation, and successes at achieving program quality outcomes. I'm gonna go through the methods. I'm not gonna spend a huge amount of time on this, but I'm happy to take questions at the end. So to give you a little bit of context about the study setting, we worked in four rural districts of Nepal, two in the Terai in the Eastern part of the country, and then two in the hills in the Western part of the country. We collected data between June and August of 2019. And in Nepal, Nepal set national targets to achieve ODF by 2017. Those were not met, although countrywide ODF was declared in September of 2019. So just shortly after we wrapped up data collection for this study. Planning and implementation of WASH in Nepal is quite decentralized. It typically occurs at the district level and below. And implementation happens by quite a wide range of stakeholders from government to NGOs to civil society. Paid technical and senior jobs are primarily held by men, whereas day-to-day -day household visits and messaging activities rely quite heavily on the labor of unpaid women, specifically female community health volunteers, women's and mother's group members. So for this study, we recru recruited interview participants that were implementers at the municipal and sub-municipal level. We specifically recruited participants who were highly involved or experienced in prior WASH programs and we look to achieve representation across NGOs, government, and civil society. Where possible, we tried to recruit a gender balance of men and women from comparable positions. Although given that men heavily outweigh women in most WASH positions, this wasn't always possible. So in total, we recruited 18 men and 13 women. The men were predominantly NGO employees and elected officials, whereas women were more evenly distributed across paid NGO employees, elected officials, and then unpaid women in female community health volunteer and women's and mothers group roles. So for day So I think Darcy might have cut out for a second. Um, <clears throat> let's see, let's give her one second to come back in.
right, so we might let uh, Darcy reconnect and um, and move on for a second. So, um, and then Darcy can come back in. We're experiencing a tropical storm here in North Carolina, and I know Darcy's in North Carolina, um, so it's quite windy, and that might be affecting some service. Um, all right, Jess, are you here? Oh, yeah, great. no worries. I was the one that was worried about my internet, but that's all right. I hope Darcy's <laughs> able to get there back soon. Yeah, yeah so we have Jess ahead. MacArthur with the Institute for Sustainable Futures at the University of Technology, Sydney. Um, and do you want to go ahead and share your screen? Yeah, great. Can you Thanks, see Jess. that? Yep. Wonderful. Well, hello, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Jess MacArthur, and I'm a doctoral candidate and also a researcher at the Institute for Sustainable Futures um, at the University of Technology, Sydney. And today I'm going to be presenting some of my work on gender equality in WASH programs. And my presentation is entitled, Measuring Gender Transformations in WASH, Findings from Digital Research. So this program is part of a wider uh, program, pardon me, called um, the Water for Women Fund. And this is an Australian aid funded program. It's 18 countries, 15 WASH programs, and 11 research projects of which the research project I'll be presenting is one of. So this research project that my team and I are working on is actually research on research, which is quite unique. Um, when quite, but actually I've seen quite a lot uh, so far at UNC, which is exciting to see, but we are doing research on assessment methods and really research on tools for measuring gender equality impacts within WASH programs. And the research is in collaboration with IDE in Cambodia, as well as SNV in Nepal. And we're looking at two different aspects to these assessment uh, tools. One is a multidimensional quantitative measure called the WASH GEM or the WASH Gender Equality Measure. This measure was designed with 10 plus years of practitioner experience in the WASH gender space, as well as a comprehensive literature review and explores five domains of gender equality around the WASH um, space. Now the other half of the research, which is my research, is the work focusing on qualitative approaches. And we had set out to design participatory and really innovative and interactive um, methods using photography and other tools. Now, as you realize action research is never a smooth transition and it's never an easy process, but you could also imagine that COVID kind of bit of threw a bit of a wrench in our strategy and our plan. And so originally I had uh, planned on doing face-to-face -face research with project beneficiaries, and we were going to be planning to do um, focus group discussions involving 25 activities around a different gender equality outcomes, as well as a set of um, uh, interview questions for intergenerational household um, life histories. However, COVID happened and so we decided to redesign the research um, and to build, put it all online. And that's what I'm gonna be presenting to you today. Another change we made as part of this COVID transition process was actually a change that Darcy uh, also highlighted, not a change for her, but something that she highlighted in her work. We know that assessments often are focusing on the beneficiary level However, we also realize that gender transformations or fundamental changes in how individuals and communities think about and engage with gender equality, those transitions happen within individual staff at the beginning. And often these staff are men and often they are working as engineers and they've come from an engineering background and may not have worked or um, engaged with women, uh, especially as community members or even with fellow staff members. So really this study has aimed to design methods to explore gender transformations for staff and then also to uh, explore what gender transformations have actually occurred with an IDE's SMSU3 project in Cambodia. So I'll be quickly presenting the methods to you now. So we selected in this, in this online transition, we selected three innovative or remote and digital methods as part of this um, this toolkit. Those methods include photo voice, which we conducted with 20 national level staff in the IDE Cambodia program. We also did participatory in-depth interviews using Google Slides so that participants could interact with the content using photo elicitation and card sorting exercises uh, as part of those interviews with eight national level staff. And what I'm going to be presenting today is actually the micro narratives from over 170 provincial and field level staff. So these are short textual answers, either or verbal or typed into their, their phones around what has changed for them in their lives since beginning the, pro well, the, what the program. And so we're looking for changes around gender equality for these individual staff members. I'm gonna be presenting three quick challenges that came out of this transition. The first challenge was designing the appropriate tools and remote methods. 
Now we, we recognize that you can't just move face-to-face -face research and just make it online. It doesn't quite work that way. We did try, it doesn't work. Um, so we decided to, to, to use design thinking principles to bring these, uh, these new methods into the digital world. We wanted to make tools that were viable for evaluation, technically and contextually feasible, as well as desirable for the participants doing them. So in the middle column there, you see some of our design, um, design criteria. We wanted the, the uh, tool to elicit stories that were specific and personal, that were related to things that had happened in their lives about gender equality, possibly undercovering unintended outcomes of the program as well, and visual and fun. The second challenge was trying to get to changes related to gender equality. We co-created prompts with the project leadership, as well as conducting ongoing feedback with participants. So individuals that actually participated in the research then shared information back with us about their experiences in using the survey. We also conducted a literature review on best practices and self-reported and retrospective assessments. So self-reported means I'm reporting information about what's happened for me, and retrospective means I'm looking back over a period of time. This literature review helped us to understand ways to ask the prompt questions in order to reduce bias. So one example of a prompt would be on the, on the left-hand side of your screen there, thinking about your involvement in the SMSU3 program, select the most significant personal change from these six gender equality cards. Obviously this is in Kumai and not in English, um, but we had different cards and different ways of sorting and understanding to get to gender equality. Now each of the six provinces received a slightly different prompt for us to test to see which was the best. The third challenge was engaging participants in data interpretation. Now, as you may um, can, can tell, we were hoping to be able to in include individuals all the way through the research process, including um, data coding um, and using collaborative participatory coding. However, with the online format, we weren't able to do that the same way we thought. So we found two solutions. First, we collaboratively designed using a, the project theory of change, a code book that would help us in con, um, content analysis and maybe even a little bit of thematic analysis possibly down the road. Now these codes, 23 of them, were designed in collaboration with the project team and were, were, came out of the project theory of change. The codes were, were um, expanded in both Kumai and English and we designed collaboratively a visual representation like the one you see here for participation using um, uh, individuals that might be uh, minorities, such as um, social or religious minorities, um, as well as individuals, for example, like in a wheelchair. Um, we also created vignette examples collaboratively to in order to for, for project staff members to understand what these particular changes were related to. All right, so all of that prep to now share you a few things of findings. Now I will give a small caveat. The data did come in literally last week. Um, so fresh, hot off the press. I do hope um, to be expanding and extending um, the findings and the, the learnings from this in the coming, coming days. But for now, you're gonna get a little tip, a little snippet, and then please, please stay tuned because we're gonna be sharing a lot more in the coming days. Now, once again, just to bring your attention back, we're looking at changes for staff members of IDE's SMSU3 project, which is a project focused on gender equality and WASH outcomes in rural Cambodia, and it's a sanitation marketing program. So I'm gonna be presenting the findings from two different questions. The first question is what changes have occurred? And the second question is what changes still need to happen? And then this is also for the micro narratives. So what changes have occurred for staff in SMSU3? In one of the card sorting activities, we asked individuals to search in, in these different six cards to select a card that most related to the change that, occur, that had occurred for them. And so 56% of the participants in this particular prompt identified that they had had change in what they thought or how they think about gender equality. And one woman said it this way in her text response. In the past, I used to think that I was a woman who could not work to earn money to help my family. Now I've changed my mind. The next highest group was in changes in what people do related to gender equality. Now these individuals, just to highlight, had had a significant amount of gender equality training and support throughout the program. And so the, the concept of gender equality, although a little bit complex, was semi known to them. So just to highlight that as well. One gentleman said, I've changed my old habits. I've come to help with cooking, help with the children and with doing laundry. Now these might seem like kind of silly little changes, but for an individual to change their habits is a fairly significant outcome of the program, even if it's just for one person. There've also been changes in what people know, how people speak, feel, and very small number of changes in what they have. 
But what is the context and the significance of these changes? So it's all well and good to collect those changes, but we wanted to give some voice to them, if you will. And we'll be following the acronym VOICE on the side of the screen. We designed this approach um, based on a, a extensive literature review, trying to understand how do we give um, some, some backing to these stories. So 87% of the respondents said that the outcome of their change was positive, which is interesting, something to continue to explore. Again, this data came in last week, haven't been able to kind of dig into it too much. 53% of them said that this change had happened to have other people like themselves. And 45% said that it definitely had happened to people like themselves in the project. 96% said that it was very important to them as a change, which is a good cross-reference. We wanted to ask this question to make sure that we were really getting significant stories of change, um, basing this on the most significant change type of approach, if you're familiar with that qualitative assessment methodology. 71% of individuals identified that gender equality training was a contribution to this change. So that, that was part, so if they mentioned a change in thinking, they also mentioned gender equality changes being a reason for that change in thinking. Now, 24% also mentioned that societal changes were also happening. And so we can imagine that this is, a, this is like a current that's already moving in, in a country like Cambodia, and the project can come along and help to, to, um, to shape and to, to support that ongoing current. Now, 71% were surprised by this change, and 87% of the people, um, uh, the staff members, thought that this change would last. Um, so this is a, a, a bit of a way to understand what the depth is. Now, again, these are all self-reported, but that's one of the beauties of qual, um, and one of the reasons that we wanted to ask these qualitatively, because we have a quantitative measure, um, the WASH gem, but we wanted to understand what people's expectations and perceptions were on the other side, from the qualitative side, using a lot of content analysis. I realize there's a lot of numbers on this page. Um, so where is this happening? Where are these changes happening? 57% of the individuals said that the change was happening at work, 53 in the family, and 39 in the community. And you'll notice that the, the count here is 182, which is higher than 170, like I said before, but individuals could share multiple stories. And so these are the different stories that they shared. We had a nine, 196 stories in total. And if 57% of these changes are happening at work and then family and then community, then you can see the ripple out effects which is kind of what you would hope in a project that's helping to shape gender equality for the staff members, that it wouldn't just change stuff at work, but it really would change how individuals interact with their family members and ultimately with their community members as well. Moving to our second question, we wanted to understand what changes still need to happen for these individual staff for a more gender equal world at home, at work, in the community. And again, this prompt was written in Kumai, so it would sound much different. And using the, the participatory code book that we designed, we pulled those 23 codes through the, the text that we had. We haven't done the audio recordings yet, um, but pulled it through the text and identified that uh, 34 of the individuals responded that they wanted to see a change in, of increased leadership of women in the workplace. 33 saying increased respect of women in the workplace and community. And 29 saying increased particip participation of women in the workplace and community. Now, just to note that this is out of 122 and there are 23 different codes that could be applied to this. So it's a fairly large wide range. Um, and you can, you can see that there's actually a lot of different changes that the participants want to see, the project staff want to see coming forward. Okay, so what does this all mean for you? Thank you so much for coming. Um, you may be coming from a completely different background. You may not be a qualitative researcher. Um, you may be a program implementer, or you may be an evaluator, or you might be just be interested in gender equality. So what is it? What can you take away from from today? Well, hopefully you can. If you are an evaluator or a program team, um, I'd love for you to think about using self-reported retrospective micro narratives. I'm working on a catchier name um, to collect <laughs> complex changes. And these complex changes could be things like gender equality, but I think there also is potential to explore things like sustainability or resilience, also complex topics that are multidimensional. Three things that we can take away from the method itself. So firstly, audio recording and qualitative surveying using a smartphone for project staff members who already have a smartphone as part of their work allows, does allow for a greater volume of data quickly and for longer responses. And it's also a very easy way to get individuals to share information quickly and um, um, privately. Secondly, a collaborative codebook and respondent coding can increase the participation for staff members throughout the whole process. So this is something that's a really great way um, to involve individuals. 
And thirdly, collaboratively piloting the tools many, many times is very important for making sure that the tools, the visuals, and the prompt wordings are, are, are valuable or, and actually are working. So we recommend including reflection with participants and with partners. We interviewed 10% of the participants after each round of surveying. And again, we went through six different prompts and everything was different. Every day we changed it. My big takeaway, don't underestimate um, the potential for gender equality training to make an impact. One woman in the, in the team, when I asked her what the biggest change in her life had been since the project, she shared it. And then I asked her, uh, how much has this changed your life? And she held up her fingers and she said, it's changed my life 10 out of 10. Um, and I think we can, we can sometimes think that these things are kind of silly. It's a, just a training about uh, women and men being equal, of equal value and equal worth. But this, if someone has never heard that before, it can be really revolutionary. So watch this space, more to come. Um, and I look forward to your questions and I'm right at 15 minutes. <laughs> Got my timer. All right, if anybody has any questions, please remember to put them in the pathable chat and then we can see them from there. Um, so yeah, you see you had some presentations, um, some questions, uh, what apps did you use? Yeah, great question. So we um, we designed this in Qualtrics with a phonic plugin. Um, if you haven't heard of either of those tools, Qualtrics is an incredibly powerful, primarily academic surveying tool, although a lot of NGOs are starting to use it. It is a paid um, requirement. And then Phonic, which is a free um, plugin, uh, you can also pay for an upgrade, is an audio recording surveying tool. And it's very, very user friendly, and I highly recommend it. Um, I have a question. Did you get an idea whether um, people valued homework or community changes at a greater, you know, instance from the mm. from the narratives? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. From the narratives, we weren't able to tell that. But as I mentioned, we also did um, photo voice and and interviews with staff mm -hmm. members as well. And um, it really depended on the individual personality. So some per people were much more likely to talk about the changes in their home. Uh, or in their work first, and then slowly as we continued the conversation, we got to changes at the home. And I think a lot of the changes at the home were much more personal and a lot more deep rooted. So changes like individuals um, helping with childcare, that would be something completely out of the norm for them, which is a, a very significant change to have from, it, from an NGO program. Mm -hmm. Does that kind of answer your question? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So I think we have time for one more question and then um, Darcy was able to reconnect. So we're gonna come back. Wonderful. Um, and, um, so one last question you had was, um, uh, did any uh, did you notice any differences in engagement or quality of growth and narrative responses between people of different genders? Oh uh, yeah, not on genders, but on age and on location. So so gender. The only thing that I got that was kind of funny is is, is the, the female respondents were much happier to use emojis. I asked people to pick an emoji about their story, uh, and the women all picked emojis, and the men were like, "This is a dumb question." Um, so that was the one kind of thing that was gender based that I can tell, but. Age was a really significant factor. So we had some of this could be facilitated or they could do it on their own. And individuals that were older much preferred to have a facilitator or kind of a help buddy there with a, with a COVID mask, just in case they had any questions. Additionally, participants that were at the provincial level and so that, so who sat in the office were also much more comfortable in recording. Individuals that sat in the field often wanted to re-record their, their, their um, recordings multiple times to make sure they had it perfect. And so this is just something of building because they were scared that they weren't um, not scared, but they were they were afraid that they would get not get the right words, and so they wanted to re-record until they got it perfect. Which um, we're continuing to work on how do we remove that for future uh, iterations of this. Yeah. Great. Well, um, so we're going to move on to Darcy just to make sure Darcy has enough time, but I'm sure Jess is willing to answer the questions in the pathful chat that were remaining. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Okay. Thank you, Jess. If you want to stop sharing, and Darcy, if you want to start. Hi everyone, thanks for bearing with me here. I think I just had a, a brief power outage, but should be good to go. Um, I'm gonna keep my in, my um, video off just in case it is a bandwidth issue, but hopefully my screen should be coming through there. Yep, you're good. Okay, perfect. If you just um, wanna put it in full screen, yep. Yeah, just to reorient everyone, I'm not gonna run through my whole introduction again, but I'm gonna kind of pick back up with study objectives and then move forward. So just a 
bring everyone back to the same page here. Thanks for bearing with me. Um, in this study, we were looking at gender, not from the perspective of program beneficiaries, but from the perspective of program implementers. And we were looking to describe differences between men and women implementers in terms of their approaches to implementation, their challenges and sources of support for implementation, and their successes at achieving program quality outcomes. Um, we're still doing this study in Nepal. I'm not gonna go through this slide again. Um, and our study participants are still the same. So for our data collection, we used qualitative interviews to look at implementation approaches and successes. We asked participants to tell us about a solution that you've used to improve WASH programming, asking them, was it successful? How did you define and measure success? And then looking at challenges and sources of support, we asked people to describe barriers and facilitators to implementing and sustaining their solutions, as well as program implementation and problem solving overall. And then finally, we asked about sources of support and strategies for overcoming these barriers. To run through some high level findings, in terms of implementation approaches, we found that men and women were taking very different approaches. Women, regardless of whether they were NGO, civil society, all took what they described as a convincing approach. They really went to the household kind of from a position of respect and humility and weren't demanding, but rather encouraged households to uptake WASH behaviors, really to protect the family and to protect the community. And there was a big emphasis on social ties where women would have personal interactions with other women at the household that say, this is really important, build for your sisters, build for the community. And they also relied on other women and community leaders to help strengthen their messages. They would visit in large groups to present a united front because they felt that their messages were more convincing when delivered in a group. Whereas when we look at implementation approaches among men, there was a difference between whether men were from NGOs or whether men were from government. Men in NGOs used more of a data-driven approach. They did either formal formative research or more informal study to really understand and target behavioral drivers. And then they would refine and share successful approaches among colleagues, for example, through social media groups or in-person meetings. Whereas men among government used what they described as a pressure approach where they really insisted that households must construct toilets in order to comply with government rules and targets. And when these messages weren't very effective as they typically were not, they resorted to sanctions to control behavior. So things like fines or arrests of open defecators who were in violation of government targets. When we look at differences between challenges and support faced by men and women, for men, men were much more integrated into sources of information support. Most men had some sort of prior experience or prior education that they were really able to apply to improve their performance. Either they'd worked in past WASH programs, they'd been to other countries like India where they'd seen successful WASH programs and had applied that learning back in Nepal. And they were much more likely to be included in high level planning committees. While the government of Nepal does set targets for inclusion of women in planning and management committees, these committees were actually so inclusive that they were, or you know, inclusive, take that with a grain of salt, they were very large. They had lots and lots of people and they were considered to really be too unwieldy for effective planning. So smaller subcommittees were formed where decision-making actually happened. And those committees were comprised pretty much entirely of men. Whereas when we look at challenges faced by men, men often had issues with low acceptability of activities. These pressure approaches that were commonly used by men in government were quite confrontational. And men described both giving and receiving things like curses or abuse or dishonor from the community where there's just a lot of tension between these insistence that you must build households and sanctions for non-compliant households. And political rival rivalries were a challenge that we found among a lot of men that didn't happen at all among women, where men were unwilling to support the activities of other men that they perceived to be political rivals. And when we look at women, women were more likely to see challenges with wages and training. Women were 
predominantly the ones filling unpaid roles as female community health volunteers and women's and mothers groups. And they often reported challenges of still having to do all of their domestic duties of childcare and cooking while also engaging in formal work. And unpaid women were much more likely to be isolated from feedback systems and training. They typically received very little, you know, a day or two of upfront training and then didn't have the same support network of regular meetings to help give them feedback and training throughout the implementation process. Gender roles that stigmatized working outside of the home were a really strong challenge for all women, regardless of whether they were paid or unpaid NGO, civil society. And they de described receiving you know, shame and abuse from community men for violating these gender roles that really stipulated that women should only work with, within the home. But despite all of these challenges, Companionship from other women was a really important coping strategy. The women would group together to present a united front and to be more persuasive. And they also received support from progressive leaders or in some cases, husbands who had more progressive views of women working outside the home. And this group support and companionship was really important for overcoming these challenges. And overall, women just had a really strong willingness to listen to each other, both implementer to implementer and implementer to household. Women were just really willing to all band together and help each other to advance the program. When we look at implementation successes, both men and women perceived that women-led activities had higher adoption and sustainability than approaches led by men. Convincing approaches were really perceived to address key behavioral drivers Whereas the pressure approaches used by government, people thought you know, that, that it's really only causing change to avoid sanctions. And then once the sanctions are avoided, people stop engaging in wash activities. So people may construct a toilet, so they're not fined, but then that toilet doesn't really end up being used down the line. Women-led activities were perceived to be more appropriate to community needs. Because women typically worked in the communities where they lived, they had a good understanding of WASH needs where men who were working in communities where they didn't live didn't have as good of an understanding of what, what the WASH needs in the community really were. And women's groups had great reach in communities. You know, women knew everyone in the community, they got together, they were social, they had strong social networks. And messages really spread quite far and rapidly in the community compared to men who are more typically outsiders. And finally, wash work was an important source of empowerment for women. Wash work gave women opportunities to receive training, education, and job skills that they otherwise wouldn't have access to. And women reported that it really helped them build their social status and expand their social network. After working in wash, we had women that reported one woman went on to start a small business selling water filters. Several women went on to be elected to public office. And overall, women just really reported that it gave them a lot more confidence for public speaking and expressing opinions within their community. So I'll just wrap up with a few key takeaways and implications here. So we found that women disproportionately face stigma for working outside the home but group support from other leaders or other women and progressive community leaders was important for mitigating stigma. So this suggests opportunities to champion women's employment through community leaders and family. And it also suggests that there are opportunities to integrate WASH and gender equality programming. Jess presented on some really great gender equality programming from the beneficiary side. And I think there may be opportunities to also reduce stigma for women implementers. And then women were much more likely to be isolated from training, education, and feedback opportunities. And yet they were highly affected, effective implementers. Both men and women perceived them to be really successful at their jobs, mostly because they're great at social mobilization. They're really using these social ties to achieve widespread and sustained WASH adoption. And to me, this suggests three things. The first is de-emphasizing technical knowledge and experience for hiring and promotion of WASH implementers. The second is integrating unpaid women into formal training and education opportunities. 
And the third is promoting hiring of women into formal paid implementation roles. And for those of you who are at the panel on um, equity in, in WASH, I think this is a really important one to address you know, systemic inequalities that persist through unpaid women's labor and continuing to reinforce the difference between, you know, men are paid, they're formal wash workers and women aren't paid and really working towards a more equal system that where women are, are equally hired into formal paid implementation roles. That's it for me. Um, I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors, Matt Freeman on this project and also our funder um, was SNV. I'm gonna close out of my screen share and see if I can turn my video feed on to do questions and see if that will let me. Uh, Knox, I don't have the pathable window open, but if you would be willing to moderate questions for me out of there, that would be great. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, you have a question. Um, let me, hold on, it's jumping around. Um, so you, you had a question about whether there was a paper or a brief available on the study that you presented? Um, not at the moment, but um, hopefully, I mean, there, there is a publication that will be coming out of this. So I, once I close out here, I'll peruse the, the chat box and we can connect after. So I thought your last three points um, had really nice links between each other. Do you think that there's a clear um, kind of roadmap that would need to occur? You know, is, is it, does one need to occur after the other? Or do you think that um, kind of simultaneously uh, encouraging all three of those final conclusion points is key? Um, I So I think there is, it's not gonna be an overnight transition. Um, I think many WASH programs, there's a long history of reliance, for example, for CLTS on natural leaders. You know, many countries rely on a large volunteer workforce of female community health volunteers. And we're not going to just overnight, you know, put all those women into paid positions. That, you know, it's just not, it's not financially feasible to do it overnight. That doesn't mean that I would advocate for maintaining that model long term. I think there that as a sector, we need to really examine is this sustainable long term and how might we transition this over time into more of a per paid professional implementation model. And I think another thing worth adding that wasn't in my slides, but is that women were motivated to work unpaid because they perceived benefits like education, job training, social status. And I think as societies become, there's more gender equality, those benefits stop existing, right? If, if women already have equal access to education, why work for free to get that? So I think those motivations for free labor may go away over time. And I think this is, the sector needs to prepare for that and to plan for that. Okay. So you had a few more questions here. Um... So uh, a, a request for clarification, um, did both men and women believe that women implementers work was leading to more sustainable changes? Um, and then, and do you have any thoughts on how we might validate those perceptions? Yeah, um, and that was something that really stuck out to me. Both men and women said, you know, women are really doing a better job here. So it, it's not just that women are proud of their work and they certainly were, but there, there was recognition from both sides that women were really quite effective. Um, sorry, I forget the second part of the question. Um, so the second part of it was, uh, and do you have any thoughts on how we might validate those perceptions? Oh, sure. Um, so I think there's a few ways. I think getting household perspectives would be quite valuable here and looking at how households perceive, for example, you know, the, the more sanctions-based approaches from government versus from women. So that's one side of things. And then I think there's opportunities for quantitative work here and looking at, you know, teams that are led by women versus teams that are led by men and looking at metrics of uptake and use, things like sustainability over time. Um, this wasn't a quantitative study, but I think there's certainly nice potential to look at quantitative outcomes in the future. Um, so um, 
another question is, do you have any data about higher level, um, oh no, sorry, every time I start reading it jumps. Um, do you have any data about higher level leadership of women in WASH either in themselves or the relationship between these higher level staff and these field staff? Yeah, um, that's a good question. So I should say that this study is part of a larger data set of about 50 interviews that included people at the regional level. Um, looking at women's leadership at the regional level is difficult just because there aren't a lot of women at you know, kind of the district provincial level and above. Uh, so it just becomes challenging to recruit a sample size that large. Uh, I think there are certainly opportunities to look at perceived relationships between supervisors and field staff. That's not something we did in this study, but I think would certainly be a really interesting piece of follow-up work. Although I should say women typically felt that they were well supported by women in NGOs felt that they were typically well supported by their senior NGO officials um, to a lesser extent with then unpaid women who weren't really connected to the NGO networks. Um, so a few, we have two more questions um, and then we'll close out. Um, so uh, were your findings shared with men and women workers and officials? Yeah, so um, things, <laughs> This has been kind of a long-term project. Um, we are not yet in the dissemination phase, um, but that's certainly an important part of, of all research. And then, um, let's see. Um, let's see. Sorry, some of these are a lot of questions in one. Some of these might be better answered and passable because I think they might have multi. Yeah, and I'm I'm happy to go back through the chat box and and okay. type out responses for the ones that we don't get to. Great. Yeah, Jess gave some really great answers too. Um, so I think we'll go ahead and um, end it five minutes early there. Um, but I just also wanted to remind you that there's a trivia night tonight at sixteen thirty EDT, um, and that also. Um, you can, of course, watch any of the missed sessions in the Pathable chat. Um, and that there's a last poster presentation at 1550 EDT. So thank you so much for attending. And um, Darcy and Jess are happy to answer your, your follow up questions. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you. <laughs>